Yeah, thank you very much, Claudio, and uh, thanks for the department for the opportunity to share our work with you guys. Uh, so, so I'm going to uh, tell you a few stories about how simple physical principle can help us gain some understanding of the very complexity of uh, biology. Uh, so maybe you are all quite familiar with this. So uh, proteins are polymers uh, with uh, 20 different kinds of amino acids. And because it's a polymer, so every bond can actually have a few rotational angles that are favorable. So many, many exponentially large number of conformations. And in the past, people mostly focus on uh, protein sequences that can uh, fold to a unique structure. So we have this so-called sequence structure relationship. But in the past 15 years or so, people understand that proteins that don't fold by themselves called intrinsically disordered protein can also serve very important functions, especially in higher animals. So there's no reason to believe that nature would just pick the folded structure. Nature would make use of anything that is available and can be made use of. So um, you can say that all conformational state, we can safely assume that can be utilized by nature to perform biological functions. So I think I showed this 30 years ago, uh, 40 years ago. So, so this is, at that time, I'm basically doing protein folding. So it's the classical sequence folded structure function paradigm. So the, the idea is that uh, protein intact by basically some sort of a lock and key mechanism by fitting the structure of one into another. So this is a uh, hemotrypsin inhibitor two, so it can be fitted into this subsidizing, which is a uh, digestive enzyme by doing that it inhibits the, the function of this enzyme. So the pro protein folding problem is of a sequence, so this is an alphabet of the 20 letter amino acid, and by folding, it would fold to this structure. This is the backbone, and this is the space filling picture of this protein uh, CI2. But it has been known for a long time, actually, that proteins that don't fold to a particular structure and a kind of disorder have important function. This is taken from a review by uh, Sarah, our new faculty member in physics, uh, written a number of years ago. So this is elastin. So this play a very important structure function in artillery, on our skin, and so on. It basically work like uh, an tropic strain, like a flowing rubber elasticity kind of a mechanism. So it, it elastic is in a disordered state. But it's only in the past 15 years or so that people realize that intrinsically disordered protein can also do something, well, should we say smarter, that is more specific interactions. And these, we call them IDP, they do not fold spontaneously. They actually perform prominent functions in uh, cellular signaling, in cell cycle, and so on. So because of that, if they are dysfunctional, they would cause various forms of diseases, especially cancer. So it's important for biomedical research as well. So IDPs are made up of low complexity amino acid sequences. That means they usually have uh, uh, fewer hydrophobic residues, more charge, polar, and aromatic residues. So some of the IDP, although they don't fold by themselves, when they are bound to their target, sometimes they will fold. So this is called folding upon binding. So this is one example. But there are some other IDPs, like this one that's studied by uh, Professor Julie Foreman K in our department that they don't even fall when they bind to the target. This is for SIG1, so there's, there's this term called fuzzy complexes. Even when they are bound, it's only locally ordered the binding site. Most of the IDP is still in some sort of a disordered state, and they can also exchange binding site. So it's, this is a new phenomenon that uh, was not aware of before. So now in the past five years or so, people realize that IDP can not only act as a discrete complex, they can also act collectively at a micron scale to form liquid-like phase-separated condensates. And this turned out to be important in many of the compartmentalization of uh, our cells, especially in uh, higher animals. So this is look like a phase-separated liquid, and so we are trying to understand uh, how this works in a very familiar way by understanding the physics of their interaction. So they, this, this, this condenser is actually very complex. It's not just one or two kind of protein in it, tens, hundreds of proteins, but uh, in uh, an increasing number of cases, people can identify a one or two main component that can also form the liquid-like uh, condensate 
uh, in vitro. Oh, so as I mentioned, because they are important for function, so if it's functional, it can cause diseases. So there are many examples over here, just one example that uh, at, at, the, at the synapses, there are these uh, phase separated particles by uh, made up of certain protein, and if there's some mutation that they, they don't phase separate, uh, the mouse would show some um, symptom like uh, autism. And this, this kind of mutation is also related to found in, uh, in uh, human beings as well. Okay, or organelles. So organelles just means that it's a <coughs> tiny organ. And we are all familiar with organelles like mitochondria and for uh, plant cell, uh, chloroplasts and the nucleus. These are all bound by uh, lipid bilayer. But there are also other bodies that are not bound by uh, membranes and now people call them membranous organelle. One example is the, the center of the nucleus. There's this thing called uh, the nucleolus that where the, is, uh, the ribosome is uh, being made and, and so it's very important for the survival of the cell. And here are a few more examples. And so this is called pea granules. So people uh, show that it's really a liquid by photo bleaching it and then after a while it will recover. So it's showing that there's actually a lot of interchange of material between the, between the solution and the condensate itself. So, so these are in the sea again, the worm embryo. And this is again the example of, uh, the, nu uh, of the nucleolus. The nucleolus is just not just a, a single liquid phase. It seems to be made up of si different subcompartments as well. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about that later. So this is a pretty picture from, uh, from a group of uh, Stephanie uh, Weber in the gill. So this is showing uh, the position of uh, nucleoli uh, on the worm. OK, so here's a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today. So how do the basic physical forces encoded by the protein amino acid sequence give rise to this remarkable biological phenomena? So I'm going to give two examples. One is conformational switches between folded globular structures. So this is still about folded protein. And the other part is that we have developed some uh, simple analytical theory to understand this liquid-liquid phase separation of uh, intrinsically disordered protein. Okay, so it's going way back, so it's about hydrophobic interaction. So we know that uh, the amino acid residue can be roughly uh, divided into two types. One is oily, it's nonpolar. One is uh, polar, so it's like one is one taste water, one loves water. And so like oil and water, they don't mix. So if you put them on a sequence, so there's a tendency for the, for the oily residues to be sequestered in the middle, and this is uh, one of the main driving forces for protein folding. So many years ago when I was uh, in San Francisco, we had this very simple model. Uh, it's called the HP model because it's two kinds of uh, uh, letters in this model. The red one is called hydrophobic is A, the blue ones are P. And so we can enumerate all possible conformation on a lattice, in this case only a two-dimensional square lattice. And then we can identify which one has the maximum number of hydrophobic contact, and we can identify that with the native structure of a real protein. So how real is this? It's not very real, but actually it captures more than, than it hits the eyes. For example, we know that if we just, the experimentalists synthesize a random polypeptide, there's almost no chance that it will actually fold the unique structure, one in a million perhaps. And in this model, we actually capture that. It's not that low, but it's only around 2% of the sequences that would have a unique structure. Most of them would not fold. That means most of them would have a degenerate ground state in the physics term. And only about 2% would have a uh, long degenerate ground state, well, up to rotations and inversions. OK, so this model has been mostly superseded by more com com complex model, more realistic model, now that we have better computer power. But in one area, it's still very useful is to look at protein evolution, because in protein evolution, we really want a model mapping between all the sequences and all the folder structure. And this is a biophysical, a biophysics-based model to give us such a model mapping, because other, there's also other approaches using some sort of a random mapping, but this actually gives additional information because at least the structure of this, if you stare at this meditate, 
this thing long enough, you see that actually it looks like protein. Okay, so in this case, this case is actually looking at a, at a family of protein sequences. So, so what is this? So each dot represents a sequence, a sequence of X and B with, in this case, 18, 18 residues. And they would all fold to this particular structure. So this is like a convergence evolution. So all 48 sequences would fold to this structure. This is a perfect sequence because there's, there could be other sequences that fold to the structure, for example, with this one being black instead of white, but this one is the one in the middle that we call the prototype sequence. We can arrange it in this way because this, by putting this prototype sequence in the middle, by defining it as the one that have the maximum number of mutation you know, neighbors. Because if we do a mutation, we can do a mutation in this model too because we can change a, 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 a white bead to a black bead and a black bead to a white bead. But some of the mutation would take you out of this neutral net, we call it a neutral net because it's neutral in the sense that they would all encode for the same structure, would take you out. And, but this one actually out of the 18 possible mutation, 10 of them would remain in the neutral net. So this is a prototype sequence that it turned out, in hindsight, is kind of trivial, but it, well, we found this the first time, that this one is also the thermodynamic most stable because if you, you, you can think of it intuitively, it, it is actually stable under perturbation by mutation, it's also stable under perturbation by heat. And so this is a plot of this, what we call a super funnel of the, of the stability of the sequences. And it also turned out, there's a, a, a paper that actually published just two weeks uh, ahead of us, arrived at the same conclusion that the, those sequences that are more connected would intrinsically the higher steady state population. That I think in the evolutionary biology uh, jargon is called a selection mutation balance because the, the idea is simple because the, the thing is losing population if actually you lose less population because of more, more neighbors that are still belonging to the neutral lab, in, in the end, at the steady state, you would have a higher web of population. Okay, so this can be used to address uh, structural evolution. For example, this is a neutral net with this structure. This is a neutral net, but you can go from one step, from one structure to, to this structure by just mutating this one to a, to a, to a back beat and so on. So the idea of using for, for physics, this is trivial, right? So, so I mean, all the conformations are populated just with this man, the different Boltzmann factor. But, but for biologists, have been focused so long on just the folder structure. So they miss out on this, and this was only becoming popular, this idea of promiscuous uh, function in the past 15 years or so. So one um, puzzle is sometimes you would, you, you, you would ask yourself, why do some organisms evolve so quickly? So the classical idea, this may be even Darwinian, is you wait for some random mutation to reach a certain state, and then you select for it. So that's like in the, in the, in the molecular, in the protein case, that means you wait for, say, for this protein to somehow mutate to this structure, and then you select for it. And if that's the case, we do a toy model simulation. It takes 2,000 generations for that to happen. But if once this is populated to a certain percentage, like 1%, 5%, because it has a certain percentage population, it always serves a better function. Then selection start kicks in, and then it can actually pull the sequence towards that, and if you do that, then actually it takes only 60 generations to, to evolve from this structure through this intermediate to this structure. Okay, so recently we look at this question is, is the so-called escape from adaptive conflict. So there's two scenarios about protein evolution, how a new structure evolved. Evolve, one is uh, called neo-functionalization. That means you, at a certain point, you duplicate the gene, and so your original gene can still serve the original function. The duplicate gene is, uh, is redundant, so it can, it's free to mutate and evolve to a new function. So this is called um, neo-functionalization. The other idea is you first, the gene actually mutates to a generalist, that means it can serve two functions. 
to promiscuous function. And only after that, at a certain point, the gene duplication appear, and then this, the two duplicated gene will separate to two specialists. So we, we build a model to try to understand how this works in our simple model. So I'm sorry this is a bit busy, but, but the whole point, don't, don't worry about this, the whole point is that we, now we have two structure, we have two neutral net, the blue neutral net and the red neutral net, so there's some interaction in between, intersection in between, and these sequences actually can fold to two structure at the same population. And we can build a fitness function by saying that the, 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 the fitness is proportional to the to the Boltzmann population of the, of, of the native state, and up to a certain point, then above that, then it's, uh, it, it maxes out. So the point I want to emphasize here, okay, so, so it looks something like this. Uh, so it starts from this structure, so, so these, every dot is a sequence. It would move, the, the evolutionary path is like that, so we go to this, so this become lower, this alternate structure. So if you have selection, this one will be favored, so that's actually an evolution drive where to go there, and at this point, then finally go to this, and then it evolves to the, the new structure. One insight that we offer here is that, okay, so if you start with this, and finally, it, in some intermediate state, it would populate all those sequences that would fold to two structures. Okay, so this, actually it would serve both the old function and the new function. And this W is actually the, in our model, is the fitness. But why do these generalists that can serve both functions would finally separate out into two specialists? Of course, one reason is probably is the fitness itself because it's better, but what we are showing here is even without uh, increased fitness, just by the connectivity of sequence space of this selection mutations balance that I told you about because only very few sequences that actually would fold to two structure, but there are many more sequences that actually fold to one structure. So as time goes on, this random drift would just separate them out. So, so this is a, it's driven by mutational robustness. It's not necessarily by fitness itself. So once it attain a double function, once you have gene duplication, they would tend to separate into special. So there are actually some example of this. This is done by uh, uh, three scientists, including Berlin uh, She's actually a U of T in the Department of Ecology. So this is something that they did of, of reconstructing ancestral proteins. So, so they have this coral uh, protein that can emit green light and red light and try to reconstruct the ancestor. It turned out that some ancestor can emit both green light and red light. So it's like our case that actually it folds to two different structures, at least conceptually. So I took this picture out already, it's just a pretty picture, but uh, someone told me that we have, we have to explain this because it's on the fire. So, so the idea is that we have this uh, uh, network of sequences, and here each one is a super funnel that folds a particular structure, and they are linked this way, and you have a close-up, you can have a two structure that switch from one structure to another from one super funnel to another. So I'm going to give you an example, a real example of this. So there are only a few cases that people have done experiment to show that by one or two mutations, you can switch from one folder structure to another. This one was done in uh, Toronto, it was done by Lewis Case Group. It's uh, people lysosome, you do two mutations, go from this structure to this structure. This art repressor is uh, quite a while ago, done at MIT. Again, it's two, two mutations, switch from a, uh, from, uh, Beta, beta strand structure to alpha twos. So okay, here today I'm going to focus on this case. This is kind of very interesting. So there's a structure called GA, which is uh, three helices, and there's a structure called GB, is four strand plus one helix. And this group in Maryland was able to do a lot of mutation, and in the end, they can switch the structure from one to another. They prove this by doing NMR, by doing just one mutation at the 45 position, change leucine to tyrosine, and then you can switch position. So we are trying to model that. So again, this is just a, a more detailed description of that. So, so one is uh, 
help women buy in both the domain, the other is uh, hemoglobin in vitamin B. So now we are looking at these 12 sequences. So, so this is GA, wild type. That means the original one that you find in nature. And then this 30, 77 just means that how many percentage they are the same with the pair, right? So the GA30 and GB30, that means this pair, GA30 and GB30, have 30 per, 30, only 30% 30 uh, of their amino acid identity identical. So finally they get to 90%, that means they are all identical except one, and then they can switch from this structure to that structure. This is a real challenge to people doing uh, explicit water simulation at least when Gunston admitted that he couldn't do it uh, in, 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 this in this paper. <coughs> so probably we can do it by, by all atom simulation. We don't fully understand the, the, the potential function. So, so we're trying to do something next best, is trying to model it by still putting the physics. So, so we use basically first a structure-based model. So this is like a cheating potential. So you have a start with a structure. You put in the potential energies that would force the protein to flow, in, flow into a structure. Okay, so this is the basics. So we make sure the protein can flow. But it's not just that. And now we use a hybrid model. So we use that as a basis. So this would be the so-called native centric potential that I mentioned. Then we do put back in the simple basic physics of hydrophobic effect and so on into this term is like a perturbation to see whether we can capture the sequence dependence of this conformational switch between GA and GB. So we first construct this structure-based model by, by looking at both structures. So we make sure that this, uh, this input structure-based potential can flow to both structures. But if you, I, I don't have time to show you the, the, the data for this, but if you just put in this potential, it's not going to switch between one and two, and actually the, it's a mess. But we combine this with a potential that actually is sequence dependence. This is actually coming from a physics group. Popasi is from uh, Lund University in Sweden. And it's a simple potential. It does not have explicit water, but it, it's uh, basically capture hydrophobic effect and the excluded water may shape of different amino acids. And you put it in, that means we have the basis. This is kind of the, the, the structure-based model, the native data structure model. We try to make the sequence-dependent part as big as possible, capture as much as physics. And then we just march through these 12 sequences from the GA wild type to GB wild type. Okay, so how do we read this? So this QA. QA means that if QA is equal to one, that means it's a GA structure. If GA, QA is small, that means it's unfolded. This is QB, so if QB is big, like this one, that means this part is the, the B structure with the one helix and four strand, and so on, right? So, so we start with GA wild type. So here is a, like a two-state folding between a folded GA structure and a folded and unfolded. So when we do the mutation, the mutation would change the sequence-dependent uh, terms in this Pofasi potential. We gradually develop this GB energy minimum, and then it switches, and then, then all the way go back to, to the GB one. Okay. So we, at least we can capture this effect, not as cooperative as in the real protein, so we're still missing, they require a lot, but at least we can capture this effect saying that it's mainly driven by hydrophobic impact. Because of the, because of the, when you change the sequence, hydrophobic impact change the change, and then this can actually derive from the transition from this one to this one. Okay, so it's a brief summary of this. So a biophysical sequence to structure mapping based on simple explicit change protein models are useful conceptual tools. And sub-functionalization of a duplication of bistable genes with dual function can be driven by sequence-based topology or this uh, selection mutation balance. And it can be non-adaptive. It's just basically just a mathematical effect because you have more sequences that are specialists than sequences that are generalists. So this would just happen. So this hybrid approach to show that we can do GA and GB uh, suggests a significant role of non-polar non aromatic interactions. And actually, we also explore putting in a more accurate ar aromatic interaction actually work. Uh, I don't have time to show it. It actually makes the, the, the model even work better. 
But probably there's a lot of things that we still don't understand. We still have to work on this. Better to understand this confirmation of speed. Okay, so now let's switch gear to talk about this intrinsically disorder uh, protein phase saturation. So a lot of the application is on this uh, for us. It's for this EPX4 protein. They, they form organelles in the cell, and it turns out that uh, experimentalists found out that the single-stranded DNA would be partitioned in the net, but double-stranded doesn't partition into it, as I told you before. Um, this membranous organelle basically uh, compartmentalization for the cell so that they can uh, stimulate particular sets of uh, biochemical reactions. These are experimental data from our uh, collaborators, so you can see that uh, the EPX4 actually is formed inside the, inside the cell. And this is in live cell, and if you change the temperature, you can actually make this droplet appear and disappear, and also in vitro, you can also make this droplet when you drop the temperature, uh, then drop the temperature to 22 degrees and drop and appears and increase the temperature you drop it to dissolve. So you know in biology, the, the main thing is about information. So we want to know how sequence dependent, uh, how, how these things are sequence dependent, right? So, so they also, the, the, the experimentalists also did this very interesting experiment. So this is the wild type that you find in nature and they scramble the charge. So the composition of the amino acid residue is exactly the same. Same set of uh, around 238 amino acid residue, but the charges are scrambled so that this one is more blocky. You can see it's like, like kind of block of positive and negative charges. These are all more spread out. They can also mutate out the phenyl ion to adenine, so this is probably helping the cation type interaction. And in this case, this the 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 protein phase separate in the cell. This doesn't. This also doesn't. So this is, uh, so we developed a simple analytical theory, which is all due to uh, my very able postdocs in, uh, in the audience, uh, uh, Dr. Lin. As, so the idea is use this uh, random phase approximation in polymer theory. So I, we won't have time to go into that, but the basic idea is that you first express the, the, the chain configuration into a collective coordinates in terms of the local density, and then you assume that the partition function is just quadratic in the density, so this is what Ijen recognized as the equivalent to the random phase approximation in ele electron gas. So the, the idea is that because most people when they talk about liquid-liquid phase separation use Florey Huggins, but Florey Huggins cannot deal with the sequence, but this approach actually allows us to deal with the sequence dependence. So you put in different sequence, you have a different phase behavior. So I guess this is a we are all physicists, so, so you know this phase diagram, so you have the phase diagram, so you knew uh, in this area it would phase separate into a dilute phase and a condensed phase in this case. Okay, so the idea is uh, part of it is Florey Huggins, so this is a Florey Huggins mixing entropy. So the key is in this kinetostatic free energy term in this RPA is in this determinants, this is what people call a structure factor. So the, well, we won't go into detail, but the, but the point is this Q, this Q vector, this Q vector is actually a distribution of charge along your amino acid sequence. So this formulation allows you to plug in this Q factor, sandwich the, the structure factor, the, this, this operator, this matrix between it, and then you can numerically produce the phase diagram. So if you have the same composition, but different Q vector, you would end up with a different phase behavior. Okay, so we first apply it to the EPX4. So here the pattern again, I, 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 it's a charge pattern I showed you before. Uh, so this is, one is EPX4 wild type, the other is EPX4 charge scramble. And we plug into our RPA, so this is in terms of basis uh, reduced temperature, well, we, we get a results that are consistent with experiments. The wild type has a much higher uh, critical temperature than the one that's charge scramble. And we can also do the sorts dependent. And actually, in this model, we can deal with the sorts 
the retinue without actually putting in by screening because the charge, the salt charge can be also put into a structure factor. And so we produce this time, in fact, the general trend is consistent with what um, the experimental is measuring. So in this case, you can see that when, when you increase the, the salt concentration, the tendency to phase separate is lower. So it's consistent with the screening of the phase status. So that model is incomplete because so far we, uh, we, we can only use this, um, this formulation to deal with electrostatic interaction. We are working on uh, a sequence dependent formula something that can also deal with other interaction, but at that point we have some mathematical difficulties. This is well known for a long time. So in order to deal with other form of interaction, we put back in a Fourier Huckman say to, to deal with the cation pi interaction. And when we put, put that back in, we can actually fit the data now, not in terms of a reduced temperature, we can even fit it to a, by, by fitting the salt dependent, we can fit it to a, a real temperature in terms of the degree Celsius. You can see that the wild type actually has a high critical temperature, consistent with the experimental fact that they phase separate, and the part scramble has a critical temperature around zero, so it's consistent with experiments that show that in most cases, it doesn't phase separate. S then we ex extend this model to look at a, a set of 30 um, COI sequences that was first proposed by uh, Mohit Papu in, um, in Washington, St. Louis. Uh, so this group, use this set of 30 COI sequences to simulate with, with different charge distribution, right? So the, the, the E is negative, the, the K, the, the blue ones is, is positive. And they show that they are all neutral, overall neutral, but they have different charge pattern. And different charge pattern give rise to different radius of duration. And they already show that is the, it more or less correlate with a parameter they call copper. So it goes something like that. When copper is bigger, the rate of duration goes smaller. Basically, that means if you have a dark block sequence because it can form a hairpin, so the rate of duration is, uh, is smaller, but if you have a strictly alternating sequence, it's basically just behaving not like a charged sequence, so the, the rate of duration is bigger. So we apply our model to this and find, find out that the critical temperature of these sequences, now we are comparing two properties. One is a single chain property of rate of duration, the other is a multiple chain property of the tendency to phase separate based on a theory. Uh, the critical temperature turned out to correlate very well with the rate of duration. So at least for these different charge pattern that are overall neutral, if it turns out that the charge sequence has a small rate of duration as a single chain, it should, according to our theory, have a higher tendency to phase separate as well. In a way, it's not too surprising. I mean, it's kind of intuitive, so because it, it, it has a more rate of duration because of these blocks of positive and blocks of negative charges attracting each other, you also expect it to attract each other in a, multi, in a multiple chain situation to facilitate phase separation. So one interesting comparison is there are two parameters that so far have been proposed in the, in the literature. One is uh, what we propose a copper parameter basically is using a window of five to six residue to scan the chain to see how, how blocky the charge distribution is. So if it's more blocky, the, the copper parameter is going to be bigger. The other is called SCD, which is an acronym for sequence charge declaration. From this, you know that actually the one proposing is a physicist. Actually, uh, Dr. Gosh is a physicist, so this actually come out in a variation approach with a renormalized crew name. So this actually have a stronger theoretical basis. And it so turned out that this is, at least in our hands, this is better because if you use SCD, the relationship between the average rate of duration is actually smoother than you use copper. And you correlate copper with the critical temperature, you, you, you do get some scatter, the red diamonds, but you use the, the green, this is a SCD, actually correlation is very good. So this is, both of these should be used, but, but I mean this charge 
pattern problems are very useful to classify uh, different charge patterns. Okay, so this uh, we move to the final uh, part of my talk. So, so more recently we are uh, interested in this question, right? So in the in the nucleolus, for example, there are actually different compartments, subcompartments, and even in general. So you have all these IDPs in the cell. Why don't they just all phase separate into a gem each, right? So they must have some kind of a molecular recognition uh, principle, which is different from the molecular recognition like CI2 binding to, to lysin because it, it's not really in a sort of lock and key situation. So we are, of course, we're only scratching the surface, but we hope to gain some understanding by just looking at the charge pattern itself. So we, we propose that there could be some kind of a multivalent, meaning that there's many interactions, stochastic, fuzzy, more of molecular recognition, that could lead them to actually partition into different subcompartments. So we are still using RPA and extend it. Okay, so, so let, let's just have an overview. So, so now, say we have a system. Now we, instead of considering just one sequence, we consider two sequences and water. So sequence one is green, sequence two is red, and water is white. So if you mix them all together, this is the kind of color that you get. And if you phase separate, they can phase separate in a binary way. Like if you here, you phase separate this. This, this is the situation when they, they are co-mixed. That means in both of the dilute phase here and also the concentrated phase, the two sequences population, they mix together. And here is an intermediate case that you can actually move along one axis horizontally, and they would phase separate. That means um, one concentration is how fixed, the other is very different from the dilute phase and the concentrated phase. And this is probably what is most important for molecular recognition, is when the phase diagram looks something, something like that, the time lines look something like that, they would phase separate. That means one phase would be rich in one IDP, but lean in one, and the other would be vice versa. So this would be like the mixing different IPP into different subcompartments. So in general, you can also have a ternary phase separation as well. Uh, uh, for the RPA theory, we were not able to find this case, but maybe with more interaction, we should be able to, but we can, we, we, but we have example for, for all this. So the generalization of the formulation is pretty straightforward. Once you can do one, you can do two, you can do three, you can do four. So you just generalize the mixing entropy into this one minus five one five two is just the, the volume fraction of water, and then you apply one, you apply two, and then now you expand the, the structure factor instead of just G, you have G11, G12 for the two sequences. So you just plug everything in. Again, you have the Q here. So once you have the Q sequence, you plug in this formulation and do numerical calculation. You can get the free energy as a function of the, this is volume fraction of phi one, volume fraction of phi two, and from the free energy surface, you can test whether the free energy surface itself is actually lowest, or you can actually have some phase separated state is lower than this uh, general sort of mean field kind of uh, free energy. And then you can construct a phase diagram out of this. So we look at six pair of sequences, so these are the sequences. So these are the SDE values. So the, the SDE value for these are pretty similar, about 16 and 17, so pretty similar. And these the SDE value are very different, 16 and 0.41. And now these are the phase diagram, and these are the time lines. So these things look like that they are co-mixed, like the example that I showed you before. And here is one of the volume fraction can remain constant, but it would phase separate into two phases with very different concentration for the other sequence. And this case is that they would basically be mixed. And now with this example, it shows that the degree to which they would be mixed depends on how different their charge patterns are. So this one, the SCD is, is very different. This SCD is about the same. So we can even make a plot of this for these six examples that we did. So this is the difference between SDZ1 and SDZ2. And so this is a asymmetry parameter. Basically, it's parameterizing the polyampholite in, in the alpha phase and the beta phase and what is the ratio between the two kinds of polyampholite. So if they are similar, then it would be small. If they are dissimilar, they would 
this would be would be would be big. So with the increase in the difference between the chart pattern parameter, you would have more and more demixing between the two types of sequences. Okay, so this is a summary of the second part of the, my presentation. So some membranous organelles are essential condensed liquid, emitting by IBP liquid liquid phase separation. Is now we realize that this is actually a fundamental form of cellular compartmentalization and organization so that we can have separation in terms of spatial and temporal arrangement. So because they're important, so it, it doesn't work, it will lead to various kinds of diseases. Uh, the phase behavior depends on multivalent interaction. So in the real situation, of course, it's not as simple as RPA. You may have many other proteins and RNA, and we, we should take care of those as well in the long run when we build up the field. But at least at this stage, RPA provides a reasonable account of the effect of charge pattern on the trend of phase separation, uh, especially for this case that we tested for DBX4. And now this latest work just came out in a new journal of physics. Uh, this charge pattern matching can be a fuzzy mode of uh, molecular recognition so that nature can partition IDP with different sequences into different membranous organelles. As I mentioned before, future efforts should extend to look at other types of interaction and also to something that we are already doing is to actually do explicit simulation to, to, to verify or to test how accurate are the analytical uh, theories. So I should just uh, stop here and make the work. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so here, the, the thing that I, I, uh, I presented didn't have a direct bearing, but I did do some pion proteins. I have two papers a long time ago on pion protein using the lactase model. Actually, it actually is with, uh, with Stanley Bruceman himself, when I was at UCSF, to, to look at when you have a, a single chain, a native structure, but when you look at two chains, the lowest energy structure is not with these two native structures bound together, it's some alternative structure. So the hypothesis, at least at that time, I haven't been keeping up with that field, is that the, the thing in your brain, say the PRP, is actually in a metastable state. But, uh, but if it takes 100 years to recuperate, we are okay. But if you have some mutation, or if you are also actually, we did some genetic simulation to show that if you have a, 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 a nucleus with, a, with a, some disposal form to put besides this healthy form, it would actually accelerate it to go to the, to the disease form. So, so if you eat a hamburger, it would trigger it to, to go faster. So, Oh, oh it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the cell is very complex. Of course, it can change a lot of things. I think the, the reason we, we, this is still useful is that in experiments, actually, they can actually make this thing phase separate both in the cell and also in the test tube. So in the cell, of course, there's many other things that are going into the, into the drug as well that probably you can measure at this point. Uh, well, in, this, in the simple model that we did, we actually just look at it at the protein level. We, we, we don't look at it at the DNA level, at the, at, the, at, the, at the codon level. I mean, there are other people who actually look at the codon level and, and, and do the mutation at the codon level and then map it onto the protein. But, but I haven't done that. But there are people doing like this model who are doing that.
Now, people, well, I'm not an experimentalist, but people have been trying to measure that, like measuring viscosity and so on. Like, uh, you know, Louis K, a paper just came out a few months ago, looking at how, what is the diffusion uh, coefficient inside the condensed space versus in the, in the superlative. I mean, people have been looking at that. So, so they, 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 they worry about the issue that, that you, you, you think about as well, whether, whether it's really liquid, and actually in the cell probably it's not really liquid, there's a, this process they call maturation. So, so in the cell it's very complicated, so it may even need an input of energy to maintain it at the liquid state. Of course, our, our model haven't taken that into account. So there may be some ATP processes that would, dependent processes that would be needed to maintain a liquid state for it. Okay. Well, I mean, as scientists, we do what we can first, and then we can build up on it, right? So, so this, if it doesn't exactly address in full the, the, the situation in the cell, at least we address the physics in the test tube. In the test tube, we don't need this to, at least for some protein, we don't need ATP. So we address that first, and then we, we worry about more complicated situations, because we are only in the beginning. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Yeah, hi. Yeah. Right. As an intermediate, which is uh, a state which is somewhat like the intrinsic glucosic protein, but it's, it's a state that's limited to a monomeric protein. So it's a monomeric intrinsically glucosic protein. And, uh, and it's been shown in, uh, in various experimental measurements that this is a common state that appears in the bulk of the Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's, it, maybe it should be explored, but, the, but there's a difference. It's actually the sequences are quite different, right? So, so your, your molten globule is still something that actually can be folded. But these things, some of these, well, I mean, some of these still would have a folding upon binding, so that may be more similar to your molten globule. There's also some IBPs that would never fold. So that may be actually quite different from the molten globule. So that may be a subset of IBP that's that's actually similar to molten globin, especially those that, that would actually fall upon binding. But you know, uh, uh, Fran talked about uh, the entropy of folding in the molten globin. Yeah. Not quite that same entropy. And, uh, yeah, and uh, right, et cetera, the IBP transition and the energetic transition. Yeah, but in the molten globin, it still it, it has a chance of locking the side chain and so on to, to finally sort of crystallize. These things, some of them would, upon binding, but some of them they won't. They would never. It seems at least. So, do you think that uh, the IDP is uh, in any way related to the natural folding pathway of? So, which one comes first? I don't know. This is a deep question, right? <laughs> Evolutionary. Which 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 one comes first? Right. So, so it's true that. IDP is actually made, is, is more prominent in, uh, in a higher energy. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> No, that's an unfolded state. Uh, so unfolding would be both zero and then. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. This one, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so, so this one is some sort of an intermediate. It's actually something what, uh, what, what uh, 
Avi is talking about, probably this is, this is actually a, a controversial topic even for experimentalists, whether GB actually have a kinetic intermediate. Some say yes, some say no. So, so this is really an intermediate, but it could be also a limitation of this force field, which I feel is not cooperative enough. So this is an intermediate, but this part, this part is unfolded. Yeah. So you're asking about that. that yeah, so that's an intermediate for GB. Uh, some people said they observed it. Some people said they didn't see it. So actually, I, I mean, this, in the paper, I actually listed all the arguments. I never thought of that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, so, so in a way, if they bind to different, sometimes they, they would bind and hold to different, so it's, it's like a, a generous, right? But if there's a selection pressure for it to act that way, so even if it's very hard, it's maintained, but I, I don't know. I mean, this is an interesting question. 